so everybody knows. So let me welcome all of you, uh, distinguished guests, colleagues, uh, rectors and the representatives, participants to the uh, online symposium. It's a real pleasure to, for me to welcome you uh, this evening to mark together the 60 years since the Republic of Cyprus established diplomatic relations with the then uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics or USSR on the 18th of August 1960, which means only two days after the establishment of the Republic of Cyprus followed by relations uh, with the Russian Federation as of the 7th of April 1992. So I think we can all agree that these 60 years have been uh, very rich in diplomatic, economic, cultural and other relations and developments in the wider ge geopolitical region. And uh, whereas this region can be described as quite dynamic and volatile. Uh, state relations between Russia and Cyprus are traditionally uh, friendly, very friendly, and occur at multiple levels, including at the highest levels of the heads of states, but also ministries, parliaments, municipalities, universities, etc., in line with uh, the principle of good neighborliness, which I think is what uh, brings us all here tonight. So I'll come back to this principle in the closing remarks. These intense relations are enshrined in a nexus of bilateral agreements in multiple fields uh, within the EU context and beyond, as well as at the political level. And I don't think we need to get into the detail of those uh, bilateral agreements tonight, but definitely that could be, you know, the topic of another uh, symposium. Just to say that uh, even lately, recently, in August 2020, our respective uh, ministers of foreign affairs, uh, His Excellencies Mr. Sergei Lavrov and uh, Mr. Nikos Christodoulidis, reiterated their shared commitment in further enhancing bilateral relations through an exchange of letters. So the University of Central Lancashire, Cyprus and Ngimo University are honored to play a small part in this overall strategy of good neighborliness by signing and acting on an MOU between our two institutions. In addition to celebrating the signing of the MOU, uh, this symposium invites you, all the participants and speakers, to reflect on the Cyprus-Russia state relations with a particular focus on diplomacy and trade, lying, we think, at the foundations of good neighboring relations and much more. So I would dare to say, but of course I'm not a diplomat, I am a lawyer, but I would dare to say that the Cyprus-Russia uh, state relations are an instance of multi-level diplomacy, aiming at healing recent history and addressing troubled times. Spatial geography provides a dynamic understanding of uh, international relations in the East Med context, and this will be presented by one of the speakers, whereas the WTO has been referred to as a trade conflict resolution method for the EU-Russia uh, relations, and this will be covered by another speaker. Before we hear from experts from our institutions, respective institutions, we will have the honor and privilege to listen to a very experienced and instrumental diplomat and former Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Ambassador Rato Kuzako Markoulis, for her address. And before I may give her the floor, I'm very pleased to pass the floor first to officials of the Russian of Ngimo University and of Yukland Cyprus for their welcome addresses. Before I may pass the floor to Denis, I just would like to make a few announcements. First of all, to thank everyone, all the speakers, the distinguished guests, uh, for their willingness to assist despite the distance and despite technological uh, or technical constraints. Uh, we understand that, you know, this is an online symposium, it's not easy for everyone. We very much look forward to working together again uh, and to a fruitful cooperation at all levels between our two institutions mm -hmm. and our distinguished speakers. 
I would also like to thank all the participants across frontiers. Here we have people uh, in several countries. Uh, please be reminded that this is an online symposium which is recorded for the purpose of widening access to educational resources such as this symposium. If you have not returned the, uh, co yet the consent form which was sent to you, please do so uh, very uh, er soon. I would please ask you to keep your cameras and Microsoft and uh, microphones off at all times and to use the chat function in the MS Teams classroom to ask questions or make comments. I will be monitoring that. If you do not wish to appear at all on the recordings, then do not use the chat function either. Please also make sure you uh, make use of the feedback form, which is in the MS Teams, uh, which you can find in the uh, in the folder. It's called feedback. So without any further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Denis Borodich, who is counselor of the Russian embassy in the Republic of Cyprus, for his opening address. Thank you very much, Denis, for being with us tonight. Thank you, Professor Shello. I'm very pleased uh, to address the symposium tonight on behalf of the Embassy of the Russian Federation in the Republic of Cyprus. First, I would like to welcome the entire participants, distinguished former Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Cyprus, Dr. Kuzaki Markoulis, esteemed members of Academic Society, representative of the Youth Club of Russian Compatriots in Cyprus, dear colleagues. Big thank goes to all organizers of this online discussion, in particular the School of Law of the Cyprus campus of the University of Central and Cashier, and of course, our beloved the Gimo University. In my welcome address, I will try to highlight the current state of affairs in the Russian Cypriot relations very briefly, as we have a number of prominent speakers ahead who I believe will present us a more detailed picture. Uh, this year we celebrate 60th anniversary since establishment of diplomatic ties between the Republic of Cyprus and the then Soviet Union. For the last two, three decades, the mutually beneficial cooperation between our countries has been greatly strengthening in a wide spectrum of areas. Around 60 bilateral agreements on state and ministerial levels between Russia and Cyprus are currently in place and they create a solid base for interaction almost in every important field. Back in September this year, during the visit of the Russian Foreign Minister, uh, Mr. Sergei Lavrov, to Cyprus, another two important bilateral documents were signed. Uh, these are the Protocol to the Double Taxation Treaty and the two-year plan of consultations between our foreign ministries. Uh, we are close to finalize a few concerning education, culture, social security and humanitarian cooperation in crisis management situations. Uh, I'm also glad to see the active interaction between Russia and Cyprus through the establishment of close relations in the field of education and culture. Uh, recently, a memorandum of cooperation was signed between the representation of the Rossotrudnich organization in the Republic of Cyprus and the University of Cyprus. Uh, in 2018, with the support of the Russian Embassy and the representation of the Rossotrudnich organization, a dual agreement program a dual degree program agreement was signed between the Gimo University and the University of Nicosia. Another step is that in that direction, uh, I think, will be the memorandum of, of understanding between the Gimo and the Cyprus campus of the University of Central Lancashire. Uh, the two countries currently enjoy a well established political dialogue, uh, which includes uh, apart from the uh, context between presidents, uh, foreign ministers, also the uh, regular context uh, between high-ranking officials from, from both countries. Uh, within the last five years, uh, our presidents have met three times. The most recent meeting took place in Beijing in April last year, where the Russian President Putin and uh, the President of the Republic of Cyprus, Mr. Nikos Anastasiadis, reaffirm the intention to maintain and develop friendly and constructive relations between the two states. Uh, President Anastasiadis has planned to visit Moscow in May this year, uh, as you know, under the invitation of uh, President Putin to attend a traditional military parade dedicated to the victory of the great, in the Great Patriotic War. But unfortunately, due to the pandemic of the novel coronavirus, these plans were not uh, realized. Uh, it is understood that the pandemic has made certain adjustments in Russian Cypriot relations, 
business cultural and uh, mostly interpersonal context between Russia and Cyprus have decreased. The traditionally powerful flow of tourists from our country has practically dried up. Uh, mutual trade this year has plummeted for more than 60% compared to the first nine months of 2019. Uh, we also had to postpone for 2021 uh, regular sessions of the Russian Cypriot Intergovernmental Commissions on economic cooperation and on military and technical cooperation. Uh, the pandemic brought new challenges to our bilateral agenda that required urgent solutions. Uh, by this, I mean thousands of Russians and Cypriots who have found themselves in a difficult life situation due to the closure of borders and flight cancellations, and therefore inability to return to their homeland. Uh, thanks to prompt assistance of our Cypriot partners, we managed to bring home more than 1,200 Russian citizens in a short time. And at the same time, hundreds of Cypriots and residents, legal residents of the island returned to Cyprus from Russia. Today, our cooperation is gaining momentum again. Both Russia and Cyprus confirmed this during the September 8th visit of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russia, Mr. Lavrov, to Cyprus to mark the 60th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between our countries. Welcoming the Russian Foreign Minister, uh, His Excellency the President of the Republic of Cyprus, Mr. Anastasiadis, stressed that relations between Russia and Cyprus are based on the principles and values that the two countries share, namely the UN Charter, and that he is ready to further strengthening of friendly ties between the two countries. Uh, Mr. Lavrov, from his side, reaffirmed Moscow's commitment to the development of all areas of our cooperation. Dear colleagues, in conclusion, I would like to stress the, that despite international instability and everyday new challenges, we have been able to not only preserve, but also strengthen our bilateral ties. The Russian secret cooperation has already proven its positive impact on the social economic development of the island. I believe that an active Russian community and the strong presence of Russian business here should be considered as one of the guarantees for the stability in Cyprus and as a factor creating a proper environment for further regional and international uh, cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dennis, for your uh, your insights and your summary of the recent uh, uh, state relations at the diplomatic level and economic level. I also think that it's worth mentioning uh, that the pandemic has somehow forced us to re-engineer the way we work and we cooperate. And uh, I look forward to even more coordinated uh, bilateral relations in view of the of the pandemic for the well-being of our citizens. So now let me try to share with you uh, the video which uh, the Vice Rector of Engimo, Dr. Andrei Baikov, has kindly sent us as he couldn't be with us. So if you will bear with me for a second. Dear colleagues and friends, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome you on behalf of Engimo University. Today's event has been designed to celebrate the 60th anniversary of establishing diplomatic relations between the Republic of Cyprus and the USSR in August 1960. In 1992, the Republic of Cyprus recognized Russia as a continuous state of the USSR. The relations between Russia and Cyprus have historically been friendly due to coincidence or proximity of our positions on a variety of topical international issues. Both countries are aiming to build a united Europe without dividing lines to create conditions for unhindered people-to-people -people contacts, to partake in the shared security space, to expand trade and economic cooperation, as well as academic and cultural interaction. We value the current russia cyprus cooperation, as it is based on mutual trust, mutual respect, and pragmatism. We, as an act of academic diplomacy, will continue, for our part, to work in the interests of international understanding and social harmony in Europe. This online symposium also marks the conclusion of a memorandum of understanding between the Cyprus campus of the University of Central Lancashire and Mgimo University. This memorandum aims to further develop and strengthen friendship between our countries and to institutionalize cooperation between the two universities. It has for an objective to share experience, knowledge and best practices. This will include multi-level academic mobility, joint programs and scholarly events like the one we are having today. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Embassy of the Russian Federation in the Republic of Cyprus and the Russian Center for Science and Culture 
for their unwavering support from GIMO's growing activity in Cyprus. Let me once again express my deep confidence that we are now witnesses of the beginning of a long and promising history of mutually rewarding cooperation between GIMO and the Cyprus campus of the University of Central Lancashire. Thank you and good luck. Okay, I hope you were able to listen to uh, Dr. Baikov, who is the Vice Rector uh, for uh, Research and Global Engagement at Ngimo University. We thank him very much for uh, his encouragement and we hope to see him soon, uh, if not face to face, at least uh, uh, on, on the screen. I think our Rector, the Euclid Cyprus Rector, Professor Panikos Pujuris, is with us. Am I right that Panikos, you're here? No, no Panikos? He's joining now, Stephanie. He's just connecting uh, now. Okay, well, we may have to give the floor to uh, Erato and then come back to Panikos if he's not with us now. Although we have we are a bit ahead of schedule. Ah, I think he connected. Very good. Panikos, you're right on time. Can you hear us, Panikos? No. No, he left again. He was there, but he left. Okay. Uh, I think we will have to uh, continue with the program uh, rather than wait, unless we want to ask a couple of questions to, to Dennis until uh, Panikos joins and um, we reach the six o'clock, which is the time scheduled for uh, the keynote. Um, Dennis, would you be able to, to take a couple of questions maybe? Sure, please. Okay. So please everyone, if there is a couple of questions, simple questions that we can address to uh, the Russian Embassy in Cyprus. I would like to uh, to say to to give you the floor. I see here that one of our students has put in the chat. I don't know where he got that from. Uh, but he actually says where he got that from. Uh, George Michael. He says that um, Ngimo University holds the world Guinness record for teaching the largest number of languages since 2010, 53 languages. So wow. I'm not sure whether uh, Igor or Peter or other colleagues and students at NGIMO uh, want to say something, but definitely this is very uh, encouraging and this is exactly what, what we mean by cultural uh, cooperation. Peter, he's here yeah. as well, good. Um, I can't see any question. Uh, Dennis, would you like to add anything on that? I mean, uh, on the on the use of languages uh, in Russia, such a big country, so rich culturally. Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, the Russian Federation is a multinational country, and uh, the languages are very important. We have, you know, like some uh, small national languages in uh, contact parts of Russia. So uh, learning languages in, in my country is uh, very important and essential for, for our people, especially nowadays when the world is open and everyone can... I, I understand I, I'm saying this uh, on the time of pandemic, but still everyone can travel abroad and communicate to each other uh, in person or just we are doing now online. So uh, yeah, I think it's essential and we it's great that Gimo provides such an opportunity to learn uh, 53 language. I didn't know about that. So unfortunately, I'm not an alumni of Gimo, uh, but I very respect this university. Uh, we have, uh, almost every my colleague uh, in the ministry, they graduated from, from there. Yeah. Thank you, Dennis. I think there's 
so thank you, George, for the for the information. There is one question from um, a, a colleague who is actually a, a lawyer here in Cyprus, Bandeli, Bandeli who is asking if, if further steps could be taken regarding the strengthening of cooperation between BRICS, the BRICS, and the Republic of Cyprus. I don't know if Dennis would like to answer this in a few words. Well, uh, BRICS, uh, yeah, it's an important international block where we participate together with our partners, mainly China and India, uh, as well as Brazil and South Africa. And we see that those countries have uh, close links to Cyprus, so that provides us an opportunity to, to strengthen our further uh, together. And uh, as we see now, China is promoting its uh, one belt, one, one road, one belt initiative, which uh, Cyprus is already involved, and uh, we support that. So I think, yes, we could find some, some further uh, some communication. Thank you very much, Denis. Now, our rector has joined us. So welcome, Panikos, Professor Panikos Pudzuris. We were, we were waiting for you because we were a bit uh, early. So um, welcome. You're on campus, actually, in your office. Panikos, we, we uh, welcome your, your welcome address. Thank you. You're muted. Good evening, everybody. I have a few words of welcome. Allow me to read the, through these. Distinguished guests, esteemed speakers, honorable fellows, dear colleagues and friends representing the Russian Federation, the Republic of Cyprus and other states. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you all to this uh, symposium, which has a twofold aim. Firstly, to honor the 60 years of bilateral relations between the Republic of Cyprus and Russia. Mm -hmm. And secondly, to celebrate the recent signing of the MOU between Ukraine and Ukraine and Cyprus. This MOU offers us the framework to promote our cooperation across educational training programs, but also research and other engagement initiatives. As per the program of the forum, so masterfully orchestrated by Professor Stephanie Lole Shailu and her colleagues Adem Gimo, we have top experts to enlighten us on the evolving international relations and offer us an insight into Cyprus and Russian bilateral relations. Notably, Ambassador Erato Marcouli, who has served as a Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Republic of Cyprus, will offer us with competent authority an overview of Cyprus and Russian relations and ephemistically define the role of Moscow diplomacy at different times for Cyprus, especially when our young and small republic was seeking protective diplomatic coverage from the various troublesome adversaries in the turbulent regional and international scene. The relationship of our people and countries are based on a traditional friendship nurtured by cultural and religious ties. Cyprus is grateful for the support extended by Russia to the struggle of the semi-occupied Cyprus Republic since the 1974 Turkish invasion, it safeguard its legal integrity and reach for a just and lasting solution of the Cyprus problem, which is fully in accord with the United Nations principles. According to commentators, Moscow has over the years systematically been offering both political security and diplomatic solidarity to Cyprus through the Security Council and other bilateral declarations, decisions, and actions that has rendered Russia the gigantic counterweight to the machinations of Ankara and Western superpowers, often 
claim the equal distancing cut in terms of the Cyprus issue. On the other side, Moscow has been treasuring the political association with a grateful and faithful friend and a natural ally enjoying pro-Russian Cypriot voice in international forum and primarily in Brussels, where commentators refer to it with the devious assertion that Cyprus is Russian's Trojan horse. In closing, I would like to offer my appreciative thanks to our colleagues and partners for the formalization with an MOU, the institutional relations between UCLAN Cyprus and MGIM. Rest assured that we are committed to fully support our academic teams so as to deepen and broaden our cooperation across frontiers and disciplines. We are very enthusiastic to build new bridges of cooperation, engaging with partners across the European Union and working with stakeholders representing education, trade, banking, legal, energy, tourism, and cultural sectors, to name a few thematic areas. Tonight's symposium heralds a new chapter in our cooperation, so I congratulate the organizers, thank the contributors, and wish you all an enjoyable and productive meeting. Thank you. Apologies for being early or late. Merci. Thank you very much, Rector. Thank you, Panikos. It's a pleasure to have you. I hope you can stay with us for a bit longer. I will. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much. So um, that concludes our welcome addresses. Uh, since Dr. Andrei Sushensov, uh, the director of the Institute for International Studies at Engimo University, is not with us tonight, unfortunately. However, we have other uh, colleagues from uh, that institute um, with us, so we will come back to, uh, uh, well, their views uh, during uh, Igor's speech. So let me now, it's six o'clock sharp, it's uh, just before six, welcome uh, our dear friend and uh, role model for a lot of young women on this island and beyond. Rato Kozaku Markoulis, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Cyprus and uh, very much involved in the Cyprus-Russia uh, relations and uh, honorary fellow of the School of Law of Yukon Cyprus. So it's our pride and honor to have you with us. Erato, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Stephanie. Uh, and thank you very much for uh, allowing me to be a part of this uh, important um, symposium or uh, I would rather say celebration of the 60 years uh, of relations uh, between uh, uh, Cyprus uh, and uh, Soviet Union and uh, the uh, Russian Federation. Um, on 24 uh, August 1960, during the discussion in the UN Security Council of the admission of the Republic of Cyprus to membership, in the United Nations, the then Deputy Permanent Representative of the USSR to the United Nations, Platon Morozov, stated the following, and I quote, for the Cypriots, the formation of the Republic of Cyprus is an important stage in the struggle for independence. It is well known that the Soviet Union has always sided uh, with the people of Cyprus in their struggle against colonial domination and has consistently upheld in the United Nations the Cypriots' right to self-determination. Hence, it was only natural that on the day when the flag of the new republic was raised over Cyprus, the Soviet Union should have solemnly proclaimed its recognition of the Republic of Cyprus as a sovereign state and expressed its readiness to establish diplomatic relations with it." Unquote. In the same speech, the USSR representative noted uh, emphatically that his country's vote in favor of the resolution for the admission of Cyprus uh, to the United Nations 
quote, should not be interpreted as signifying any recognition whatsoever by the Soviet Union of the provisions relating to the retention of foreign military bases in the island of Cyprus, unquote, which military bases the Soviet Union considered as contrary to the principle of sovereignty. This year marks uh, 60 years of diplomatic relations between the two countries, which uh, reflect uh, the historic and uh, outstanding relations of friendship and cooperation of the Republic of Cyprus with the Union of so Soviet Socialist Republics and since 1992 with its successor state, the Russian Federation. This is evidenced by the notable exchange of high-level visits over the years, the signing of uh, more than uh, 60 bilateral agreements on a very wide range of sectors, the existing political dialogue between the ministries of foreign affairs, the close economic relations, especially in the field uh, of investments uh, and uh, tourism, and the extremely friendly relations between the two peoples, which are based on historic bonds of cultural and religious affinity. Nevertheless, the most important aspect of our relations uh, has been uh, Russia's long-standing support uh, for the Cyprus problem, especially in its capacity as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, which has served over the troubled years since 1963 as a true political shield, especially against the Turkish violations of the sovereign rights of the Republic of Cyprus. As a result of my 30 year long diplomatic experience, eight of which at the United Nations, and my two terms as foreign minister of the Republic of Cyprus, I had been indeed privileged to follow very closely the position of the former Soviet Union and since 1992 of the Russian Federation with regard to the Cyprus problem. An important tool to evaluate uh, this position has been, first of all, the voting records on the relevant resolutions adopted, and uh, secondly, the respective uh, statements during the debates held both in the General Assembly and in the Security Council of the United Nations. With regard to the first, uh, that is the adoption of UN resolutions on the Cyprus problem, a very consistent pattern of staunch support can be observed throughout the past 60 years, reflecting the Soviet Union's and Russia's full respect for the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of the Republic of Cyprus and uh, its consistent support for a Cyprus settlement based on the UN resolutions, which provide the appropriate uh, framework and the parameters endorsed uh, by both leaders uh, of the two communities and uh, by the international community. The only negative vote on the Cyprus problem, in fact, uh, it was exercise of a veto right, of Russia in the Security Council was cast uh, on uh, 21st April 2004 when a draft resolution was presented by the United Kingdom and the United States that uh, would have terminated the mandate of the UN peacekeeping force in Cyprus and replaced it with uh, the UN settlement implementation mission in Cyprus provided in the Annan plan. Such a move was considered by the Russian Federation as an external interference or uh, pressure exerted on the sides that could influence the outcome of the two simultaneous referenda, which uh, were scheduled to take place three days later on the Annan plan. There is no doubt uh, that this uh, foreign policy position of Russia is not uh, merely based on the classical promotion of her own national interests, which uh, is uh, only natural, uh, but on a more solid approach uh, on, uh, of defending certain principles embodied in the UN Charter, 
in the case of a small country victim of foreign aggression and occupation, it was strongly felt that, uh, quote unquote, abandoning Cyprus to the mercy of the expansionist ambitions of Turkey, which is a member of the NATO pact, would have set a very bad precedent internationally, which would not have served the interests of any international law abiding country, the UN of course included. With regard to, uh, to the position of the Soviet uh, Union and the Russian Federation in the UN debates uh, on the Cyprus problem, again, uh, we observe a very consistent pattern of staunch support during all the difficult and at times uh, tragic moments uh, for the Republic of Cyprus, starting with the intercommunal conflicts and the threats uh, of invasion by Turkey in 1963-64, the establishment of the UN peacekeeping force uh, in Cyprus in 1964, the coup d'etat against uh, the president of the Republic of uh, Cyprus by the Greek junta, and the two phases of the Turkish invasion in July and August of 1974, the attempted cessation of the occupied uh, part of Cyprus and the illegal proclamation of a separate state in 1983, as well as throughout all the different initiatives and uh, the good offices uh, missions exerted by all seven UN secretaries general for the solution of the Cyprus problem. As an example of this support, I will quote uh, extracts uh, from three statements of the Soviet Union uh, representatives in 1964, 1974, and 1983, which uh, to my mind uh, expressed uh, in the most explicit uh, way uh, this uh, very staunch uh, support uh, of uh, uh, Russia and uh, the former Soviet Union. On 19 February 1964, the permanent representative of the Union of so Soviet Socialist Republics, Ambassador Nikolai Trofimovich uh, Fedorenko, uh, in a very lengthy intervention, I think it took uh, more than uh, an hour and a half of two or two hours in the debate of the Security Council following uh, Turkish threats uh, to invade the island, concluded as follows. And I quote, the Security Council must, must take urgent measures to protect the Republic of Cyprus from aggression and to prohibit and stop any foreign intervention in the internal affairs of this small state member of the United Nations. It is the duty of the Security Council to safeguard the national independence and the territorial inviolability and integrity of Cyprus and to ensure respect for the sovereignty, the freedom and independence of the Republic of Cyprus in accordance with the purposes and the basic provisions of the UN Charter." Unquote. In his statement in the debate of the Security Council on uh, 15 August 1974, that is following the second invasion of Turkey, the permanent representative of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, uh, Ambassador Yakov uh, Malik, stressed uh, the following, and I quote again, the Soviet Union is in favor of protecting the independence of the Cypriot state, which wishes to pursue a policy of non-alignment. It is in favor of maintaining the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of the Republic of Cyprus and opposes the partition or annexation of the island in a, on any pretext. The Soviet government insists on the immediate cessation of, mili of foreign military intervention in Cyprus, the withdrawal of all foreign troops from the island, and the restoration of the constitutional government of the Republic of Cyprus and of all the institutions of that government." Unquote. Finally, during the debate of the Security Council held on 18 November 1983 on the attempted cessation of the occupied part of Cyprus, 
the Soviet permanent representative uh, to the United Nations, Ambassador uh, Oleg Trojanovsky, reaffirmed most emphatically the Soviet Union's uh, solid position. And I quote again, the Soviet Union cannot but share the profound concern of the international community at the proclamation by the leadership of the Turkish uh, community in Cyprus of a so-called independent state in the northern part of the island. The events now being considered by the Security Council have the particular feature of uh, having occurred in the part of the territory of the Republic of Cyprus, which is under foreign military occupation. It is clear that this separatist act can only lead to a further exacerbation of the situation in Cyprus and subvert the foundations of and prospects for a just political settlement of the question of Cyprus. There is no doubt that that act should be condemned. The Soviet Union condemns all actions which uh, undermine the territorial integrity of the Republic of Cyprus and uh, create uh, a threat to peace and international security. The Soviet Union believes that in the interest of peace and tranquility in the area, the leadership of the Turkish Cypriot community should rescind its decision." Unquote. It is obvious uh, indeed from the above statements, which constitute but a very small fraction of the massive diachronic support of this very important permanent member of the Security Council towards the Republic of Cyprus, that without Russia's principled stand and political shield, particularly in the United Nations, developments would have uh, probably evolved very differently and uh, I dare say would have been detrimental uh, for the Republic of Cyprus. It is for this reason that I have always throughout my career as a diplomat and as a foreign minister and now maintain the view that Russia as a permanent member of the Security Council should always remain an important ally and a valuable partner and thus should be kept fully informed at all times by the government of the Republic of Cyprus regarding our positions and our intentions on specific aspects of the Cyprus problem. Close cooperation should also be established and maintained at all times between our permanent missions in New York, Brussels, and Strasbourg. Now, apart from the Cyprus problem, there is a broad scope of, uh, for much uh, closer cooperation between the two countries in many, many other fields. Tourism and investments uh, have been booming over the last uh, 15 years to the benefit of both countries, with uh, nearly 1 million Russian tourists' uh, arrivals having been recorded in Cyprus in 2019, and Cyprus being included among the top three countries investing in Russia's economy. The funds uh, of uh, such investments were mostly of Russian origin and uh, they were reinvested in Russia using the extremely favorable terms of Cyprus' legislation. Additionally, Russian businessmen uh, are uh, also investing in Cyprus, taking advantage of uh, Cyprus's EU membership, of the high quality economic and legal infrastructure, of the connectivity of Cyprus, of the stability and safety, and uh, uh, I think most of all, the friendly attitudes of the Cypriots towards the Russians. Another area of cooperate, that cooperation could be greatly beneficial for Cyprus is academic cooperation, and particularly research. Relevant agreements uh, should be signed, uh, uh, and both governments uh, should encourage uh, cooperation between academic and research institutions. Uh, for this reason, the conclusion of the Memorandum of Understanding between the UCLAN 
Cyprus and the Moscow State uh, Institute of International Relations uh, of the University of uh, Moscow is uh, a glaring example of uh, such cooperation. And I uh, strongly uh, congratulate uh, both universities uh, for this uh, uh, collaboration. The Russian Federation could also be very instrumental in sharing with the Republic of Cyprus her valuable experiences on energy issues, not necessarily on the hydrocarbon exploration and exploitation. In any case, uh, we should be very, very careful not to be seen as being antagonistic to the Russian Federation or promoting ours and the EU's interests to the detriment of the interests of Russia, but as working with our neighboring countries and others to create parallel energy corridors to diversify and thus strengthen energy supply and energy security. Now, since uh, the Republic of Cyprus became a member of the European Union, we have had um, limitations as far as uh, differentiating our foreign policy position on a number of uh, major issues, including some of direct concern to the Russian Federation. Nevertheless, because of our very close political, economic, financial and trade relations with Russia, uh, we have tried, along with uh, other like-minded uh, partners in the European Union, to influence the adoption of more moderate positions towards Russia in order for the sanctions not to adversely affect uh, the economies of member states, including our own. In conclusion, allow me to say a few words regarding the status of relations and uh, close rapprochement and cooperation between Turkey and the Russian Federation during the last uh, four years, covering such uh, highly uh, geostrategic areas like the construction of the AQU nuclear power plant, the launching uh, last January of the natural gas pipeline Turk uh, stream, and the purchase of the S-400 missile system, to mention just uh, these three. On the other hand, in recent years, the United States of America and the Republic of Cyprus have been nurturing closer and uh, more strategic cooperation between them, which culminated last December in the adoption of the Menendez Rubio Eastern Mediterranean Security and Energy Partnership Act uh, of 2019, which uh, unfortunately uh, included a last uh, moment uh, amendment based on which the government of the Republic of Cyprus should take the steps necessary to deny Russian military vessels access to its ports for refueling and servicing. Uh, the President of the Republic of Cyprus, uh, Mr. Nikos Anastasiadis, publicly emphasized that, that such a demand is totally unacceptable to the Republic, as it would curtail Cypriot uh, sovereignty. I would add uh, that, uh, moreover, it would violate an agreement signed in February of 2015 between President Anastasiadis and President Putin to give Russian military uh, uh, ships access to Cypriot ports, mostly to counter international anti-terrorist and piracy efforts. Nevertheless, uh, US officials uh, who visited the island recently, including uh, Secretary of State uh, Pompeo himself, reiterated the US's concerns over the regular entries of Russian vessels in Cyprus ports and ask the government to heed to these concerns. These developments uh, should be seen with extreme caution and every effort, and I want to emphasize that, should be made on both sides, the Republic of Cyprus and the Russian Federation, not to upset or disturb the long-standing, friendly and very, very close cooperation and mutual support between the two countries. My dear friend, uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov was categorical 
when asked about Russian-Turkish relations. In an interview published in the, in the Daily Philelefteros on 7 September 2020, a day before his working visit uh, to Cyprus commenced. And I quote him, as uh, for our relations with Turkey, I would like to assure our Cypriot friends once again that the current development of, of Russian-Turkish cooperation and the need uh, for interaction with Ankara on regional matters are not having and will not have any effect on our dialogue with Nicosia, unquote. Foreign Minister Lavrov has been and will continue to be an invaluable friend of Cyprus. And we should work very closely with him and the government of the Russian Federation to maintain and to further strengthen our relations, having always in mind that this friendship has endured for over 60 years and has flourished, not because of pragmatic interests, but more importantly, because of deep-rooted values and principles upon which both countries have based these relations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Erato, for this uh, beautifully worded uh, historical and, uh, and political uh, overview of the past 60 years. I think all the keywords are there. I was uh, trying to educate myself in the past few days, and uh, I couldn't agree more with everything you have said, including the last words on uh, shared values and um, the 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 ele elevated uh, objectives of the relationship and the need to maintain at all costs uh, uh, good neighboring relations, including within the EU. So I think this is a, an analysis which stands not only from the diplomatic point of view, but also from uh, an EU law point of view that I am an expert in. But I will conclude on this later on. So. It's so uh, much appreciated. I'm sure you will get some questions in the Q&A session, but uh, for now, however, perfectly on time, uh, we are going to give the floor to our uh, Russian uh, colleague from Engimo, Dr. Igor Okunev. Hello, Igor. Director of the Center for Special Analysis in International Relations of the Institute for International Studies at Engimo University. And Igor is going to talk to us about uh, the role of spatial analysis. So spatial analysis in international relations, focusing on Russia and the East Mediterranean. This is very much appreciated, Igor. I had a look at the slides and I must say that I need your explanations <laughs> to fully appreciate the slides. So, Igor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm very glad to be with you. And uh, thank you for organization of this wonderful symposium, quite on time. And i uh, really looking forward for cooperation between two universities. This is really a huge uh, role. We have a huge potential here. So I will try to uh, open my slides. So do you see my slides? Because I'm not the best in... in... Yes, yes, Igor. Oh, great. So just start show, slideshow, and uh, it's very clear. Good. Okay. Uh, so if there will be any more, just interrupt me. Uh, well, I would like uh, to look on the uh, relations and diplomacy from another perspective, from, uh, from geography and from data analysis. Uh, because this Institute of Inter for International Studies, uh, which is organized many, many decades ago, in Soviet times already, uh, it works uh, between fundamental academic science and expertise to the MFA. So 
we are doing uh, expertise uh, to the ministry for most of the issues of current relations. And at the same time, we developed uh, theory and methodology of analysis of different techniques uh, and some fundamental research. And I, I think that combination is a good way to look on international relations. And uh, at the same time, working at uh, quite a new center, the Center for Spatial Analysis, that introduced the geographer overview on international relations. I'd like to tell you about the project we are doing now and uh, we will be doing for the next five or six years, I think. I think, and uh, well, uh, probably there will be some room for cooperation with Cyprus partners. So this project is about publication and development of Atlas of International Relations, uh, which is, well, we don't have a lot of atlases for international relations today. Well, we have some, uh, most of them are French, but we still don't have an atlas of international relations that will use uh, uh, computer modeling, geographic information systems, uh, that will use spatial metrics, that will use statistics, data analysis to analyze the international relations. So we would like to map the uh, international relations, the uh, spatial distribution of power and spatial architecture of a relation of international relations we live in with this technology of uh, spatial analysis. We did the first volume of this atlas in Russian and we just now in the process of, uh, well, we begin the English project uh, of this atlas. So I will just show you some, some of the maps from this atlas and I will give you some uh, basic idea of this atlas uh and and have a glance to the eastern Mediterranean. so we what we do there well we do many many things there but some of them most interesting well first our idea is to give visualization of world politics because world political map is really not the thing that gives us best impression of how the international relations how the world community is structured so we do different techniques uh, uh, different geographic techniques to show the new spatial structure of international relations. Well, here is the technique called cartogram, where the size of the country, this is not the size of the territory, but this is the size of some parameter. For example, here we took population, and as big a country, the bigger uh, population you, he you have here. And with this map, you see how smaller Russia uh, by population comparing to Asian uh, uh, countries, uh, how small Latin America, how smaller uh, Canada, for example, and so on. So that's the better picture of today's uh, of the, today's political map. Another glance will be the percentage of world GDP, and here you have absolutely different picture with Europe growing, with US growing but very small Africa here. So another view, and we have many, many dimensions and we need to combine them to, re to see the real picture of the world. Another technique, this is two and a half D dimension cartogram. Uh, we did it by many parameters, but this is for military power. So how high is entry, it means that it is it has more military power, like on this, well, when you have sports and the higher you are on pedestal, you are stronger or you are closer to the, to the winner. We, we did this, so you have very high the US, for example, so that you even can see Canada uh, on the back of it. Uh, and the problem here is that some of the countries, they drop down uh, because they have some significant problems with the security. So we have some areas on world political map that just drop down. So we do the different techniques like this. Next task was to count spatial autocorrelation or to answer the questions like this. Uh, well, if country is surrounded, if, if country is surrounded by democracies, 
does it increase the potential of this country to become a democracy? Or is it, if it is su surrounded by rich countries, is it increase this potential of this country to be richer? Uh, is it, if it is surrounded by uh, countries with many internal conflicts, does it increase uh, uh, does it uh, decrease the level of security in this country? So we uh, measure this neighborhood effect on many, many 100 parameters from economics, politics, sphere, ecology, uh, healthcare, education, science, uh, mobility, well, many, many culture, many, many different aspects. And we measure where this geographic law works. Well, you know, there is a first law of geography, uh, which, uh, well, which was proposed by Swiss scholar Walter Tobler. He, so, he said, everything is related to everything. But those things that are near each other relates or interrelates more strongly. We try to estimate the, this relation. For this, we, we use different techniques, but I, I will show you only one. So uh, this is a Moran's, I in, Moran's index of uh, spatial autocorrelation. So we put here one parameter, for example, young population, and we put here lack young population, meaning the average of young population in the neighboring countries. And we see quite a correlation, for example, uh, for this parameter for young population. Uh, well, uh, very, very easy idea, but uh, very huge formulas here. Why? Because the biggest problem for measuring spatial autocorrelation will be to give the system the ideal of a neighborhood. Well, who are neighbors to Russia? Those countries that has the same border wall, who will be the neighbors of Cyprus then? So if we take only neighbors by land, Cyprus will be neighborless, which is not actually the fact. So what we should find the nearest country, well, then it will be Cyprus or Lebanon. But well, can we measure Cyprus without the Greece? So huge problem how you would uh, how you would introduce neighborhood idea. And that's the biggest issue in spatial analysis and the biggest issue we are working with. Well, for our first atlas, we did quite simple thing. We, <clears throat> uh, we just proposed that every country has the same number of neighbors. Just, we just took eight because usually, well, in average, there are six neighbors to all countries. And we added two uh, because there are maritime countries and maritime borders. So this gave us eight. And we just found eight closest centroids for each country and we announced the neighbors of this country and this is the um, uh, neighborhood matrix we did by this and uh well here you could find interesting ideas well for example all this north africa became part of a neighborhood effect it, uh, it is closer to europe than to another part of africa so africa is highly divided you see here by if we just take very simple geographic idea and for Russia, well, if you take the centroid, Russia is absolutely not a European country. That's why for this atlas, we count by capital city and capital city of Moscow makes Russia absolute European power without any, without no Asian uh, neighbors. So that shows this dif difficult position of Russia uh, between two continents. Well, what we did next, we started to look to mapping this local autocorrelation to show the spatial clusters, where we have some clusters of high correlation for this parameter. So we have high correlation of index with the neighboring countries. So I will show you a couple of examples. It's called LISA, the method, local indicators of spatial autocorrelation. So for example, in the Middle East, we have the high Autocorrelation between on military expenditures between the country and its neighbors. Uh, so that's a great example of uh, of an idea that when one country start uh, um, increasing its military expenditures, then the neighbors will do the same. And we see this in the Middle East. 
and here in light blue well in in uh, dark blue we see another effect low cluster so here the correlation between neighbors are low in military expenditures well no great threat even russian threat here well countries uh, decrease their military expenditure and here we have in light blue we have cyprus because in comparison to, to its neighbors cyprus has significantly low military expenditures so this uh, technique gives us this exclusion and we could uh, we, and we could discuss this exclusion how it happens those exclusion can well, this will be another picture. Um, percentage of women, we have high classes by percentage of women in correlation to the neighbors in the Eastern Europe. And this is be probably because of migration from Europe. And another way uh, in, in the Middle East, a low percentage of women in comparison to the neighbors. So that technique gives us another view on world politics. I would skip this. Uh, we did also uh, multivariable uh, analysis when we took many, many parameters and we look where, what are the, uh, well, whether the closest countries has the same parameters. Well, we measure here the idea of the regional security complexes. So there is an idea in theory that many countries next to each other, they have the same threats, and if they have the same threats, they will have the same security answers to these threats, and that led them to build some regional security complex. So we did many parameters, and we check whether really uh, we have some countries that have the same threats and answers the same. And we found, yes, in Latin America, in two parts of Africa, and in, 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 it's interesting, in Europe, we have the same threats, one, one cluster. And Russia is there within Europe, sharing the same threats and answering the same threats, which gives this idea of one security uh, space from Lisbon to Vladivostok, well, some, some interesting things. Well, for example, Turkey won't be part of this security complex. Uh, we did also multidimensional uh, scaling, multidimensional scaling. Uh, well, we, uh, we did this hypothesis. What would be the political map if geography law was absolute? Meaning that the closest countries, the, the countries are that are this that that uh, well very close in their economics, politics, culture, and so on, will be close to each other in the political map. And we found uh, that the, the world was divided. Uh, was organized a different way. Well, here, for example, will be some part of the countries of Western democracy, including Canada, Australia, uh, Japan, and others. We have two countries that are most uncommon, different from other world, China and US. And we have some countries that are closest. The very interesting part of the world will be these countries, including all BRICS countries. I will show you these countries. We, we found them when we did cluster analysis with 20 clusters. These countries in blue, they are here next. Well, they are closest to this China and USA, but still far, very, very far away. So uh, Russia, Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, India, Indonesia, uh, Thailand, many Latin American countries, Mexico, South Africa. So. Very Morocco, very interesting group of countries uh, which are quite independent in their foreign policy, uh, that are quite modernized, that develop the economy, but that are still not part of the uh, Western democracies camp uh, and are playing some specific, significant new role in world politics. So we found this mathematics, this group of countries, and they're very specific role in world politics today. So two superpowers, US and China, yes, and this very interesting group uh, after them, and then this Western uh, democratic uh, bloc. Uh, as I showed, the Mediterranean region looks really like one region. Uh, uh, for spatial analysis, if we do just geometry, but if we took analysis for most of the maps, what we did, 
uh, this um, this region split it between Europe and Africa, Western Europe and Eastern Europe, Western Mediterranean and Eastern Mediterranean. So that gives us the idea that there are more lines of difference, more cleavages, I would say, than something that unites this region at the centers was very united by culture. So, well, I will show you just different indexes. Well, see here, we just took the values, values of post material and the region is highly divided. Uh, well, here we took uh, natural resources uh, and also the region is highly divided. Uh, well, this is will be exception. This is uh, uh, HID. And here in HID we see more unity in this, but I would not, I would not celebrate this unity. Uh, well, this will be. Uh, well, uh, uh, that was a mistake. Well, on both sides of Mediterranean we have this uh, cluster of low, uh, low percentage of HID uh, in comparison to the neighbors. We always do this comparison to the neighbors, so that, that's good news for this region. And this is something that be nice. This region. Uh, well, some deaths from suicide we have in Northern Europe, we have high uh, cluster of suicides, but in the Mediterranean, we have much less suicide in comparison, once again, to the neighbors. So those HID and suicides are only the two parameters when we found some unity. Uh, and well, it's also, uh, well, it should be explained. There should be many, many explanations here. Well, I just wanted to introduce this project and some ideas that we want to do, and probably we will find some sphere for cooperation here with you. We'll probably will provide some methods for Eastern Mediterranean or Mediterranean. So we are really open for cooperation here. Here are my Instagram and my email, and I'm very open for any communication for any of the participants of this symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you, Igor, for presenting to us, I think, uh, something which most of us uh, are not familiar with. You did mention that there are uh, such maps for Atlas in, in France, and indeed, I can confirm that I have some at home. I mean, it's a very uh, common uh, approach to world affairs to look at uh, geography and spatial geography or or atlas of international relations um, because that explains so much and uh, i think your your diagrams uh, or your, your cartograms are, are quite um are quite uh, encouraging because we can actually see synergies and uh and uh yeah so some things are explained more easily through a map than uh, through any sort of uh, of dialogue. I'm sure there'll be questions for you perhaps to uh, start looking at the Eastern Mediterranean region more particularly at a later stage. And of course, I have plenty of uh, methodological issues or questions, but that can be done at any other point, not for tonight. So thank you. Again. Now, uh, our last topic before the Q&A is a, a, a very different topic. Um, it's presented by our colleague and friend who is based in Denmark at the Copenhagen uh, Business School, but is also a very good uh, visiting fellow, an important visiting fellow at the uh, senior visiting fellow at the School of Law of Ukraine, Cyprus, Dr. Henrik Anderson. Uh, if you can appear somewhere, Henrik. And, right. and Henrik uh, has been a colleague for many years, and we have worked together on, on, on various um, fields, uh, in particular the WTO. And we thought that, you know, concluding with uh, looking at the uh, Russian-EU uh, relations under the WTO is, is a good uh, tool to actually implement what Erato has been talking about. So uh, Henrik will present the WTO dispute settlement system as a new actor in the EU-Russia trade relationship. So Henrik, the floor is yours if you can share your slides. Thank you. Right. Thank you uh, very much and good evening to, to everybody. Um, and just to make sure, can you hear, you can hear me, right? Yes, very, very well. Very good, very good. I'm going to um, 
find my my slides here. Right, and let me know, can you see them? Yes, we can, Henrik. Right, thank you. Now, what I want to, to address really is, uh, as, as Stephanie just mentioned, the WTO dispute settlement system as a new act in the EU Russia trade relationship. Now, the reason why I think this is important is that at at the end of of the trade relationship, we have the businesses. They are really the ones performing uh, in a trade relationship. The states they are facilitating um, uh, trade by opening up. Uh, uh, the borders uh, allowing the access of, of products. Um, um, but for me, it's a question of the business. And in the EU Russia trade relationship, now since Russia joined the WTO uh, in 2012, it has, of course, also had an, an, an impact uh, for the businesses not only from a state perspective, but also by having this WTO dispute settlement uh, system as a new actor uh, in that uh, trade relationship. So, and that is something that I'm, I'm going to um, going to to uh, address. And what my claim is is that. Um, by moving trade into the WTO, it has also moved this trade relationship between Russia and the EU from a more power oriented system into a system that is developing uh, a rule of law. And that is where this the role of the WTO dispute settlement system, uh, we call them quasi judicial bodies because they're not really court. However, I'm claiming that the work de facto uh, as as courts and they are promoting a uh, rule of law and legal certainty which is very uh, relevant for businesses but i'll come back to that uh, in a minute now the first thing i would say is that when we look at the eu and russia in the wto they have used the dispute settlement system against uh, each other there have been eight cases uh, in in all between them um, and they have four times each made a complaint uh, against uh, each other. When we take a broader look at the use of the WTO dispute settlement system, then the EU has been a very heavy user of, uh, of it. It has been a compl uh, complaint 104 times in the WTO, and it has uh, been a respondent 87 times, and it has been a third party uh, because all members of the WTO, they can be third uh, parties in all cases, and that means that they can come with with their own views uh, on um, on the interpretation of of the rules uh, and the impact that those interpretations they will will have for uh, for society. Uh, Russia has been a complainant eight times in all since it joined the uh, WTO and it has uh, responded uh, nine times uh, to cases and it has acted as a third party uh, 86 uh, times. I should also um, apologize to you if my voice it breaks a little bit. I am a victim of the Danish cold and humid uh, weather at the moment. Um, so and and that's the reason uh, why. So just so you so you know it. Now, if we come back to the businesses, uh, rule of law and legal certainty. What is it that this WTO dispute settlement body can do for Russian and EU enterprises? Now, if we first of all take a look at the rule of law, the meaning of it is that law is supreme, and that means that we are moving away from power oriented decisions into a rule based uh, system. And when we do that, we have the expectations, of course, that the law will provide the certainty as well. And that means that for businesses in particular, that they will have an idea of how to anticipate their investments. 
But in order to have the, the sort of expectations of legal certainty, it must be in a rule of law system. There must be an independent third party institution that can settle uh, disputes between the parties. And that is what we have in uh, in the WTO. Now, when we look at international law, there's always an issue about international courts, because what's the value of decisions made by international courts? Because international courts are not there to create law, they're there to interpret the treaties and to apply customary rules uh, of international law as well as principles of, uh, of international law. And international courts can somehow be between state politics and between this sort of uh, ideal, this legal ideal of creating legal certainty by keeping law uh, supreme. And that's something I will address what has happened in, in the WTO here with, uh, with a dispute settlement system. What is the legal value of the recommendations that they come with? Because clearly if they create precedent, then for businesses they can have some expectations for the future investment. How will the law of the treaties of the WTO, how will they be interpreted in future cases? Then another issue there is uh, when we look at uh, international law, that is the fragmentation of it, because we talk about here um, a court-like institution in a in the trading system, and that means that the WTO dispute settlement system they handle trade cases, but of course trade cannot be isolated from all other areas, uh, all other sectors of law. For example, environment. Um, the problem can be that you have some products that cause uh, environmental harm. Um, can a state say that they, they will reject those kind of products? And what if we are not talking about environmental harm that is happening because of the product but because of the production processes something taking place in another state what will happen in these situations there um, and that's a question here can can this trade uh, dispute settlement institution can they somehow provide some legal certainty in in these areas as well my focus here will be on the envi environmental uh, issues for businesses, now, why is it important with, with legal certainty? Well, it's because it will reduce the transaction costs and transaction costs. That's what we, we call those costs of using the market. Clearly, if a company cannot anticipate what will the barriers to trade, what might they be because they cannot see through, for example, red tape or they cannot see, th see uh, through what kind of um, obstacles to the market that states that will create, then of course it will uh, increase the transaction cost of the companies uh, for the companies in, in the exporting country as well as the one in the importing. And that is in this case, of course, for the Russian businesses and for uh, the EU uh, businesses. So by having legal expectations through legal certainty, these companies, they can plan the future in investments and how they are going to carry out the trade uh, between them. If we just take a very quick look at what is the World Trade Organization and its main principles, um, I should, of course, first of all, say that the World Trade Organization is for the states. Um, there are three areas that the WTO deal with that is trading goods, trade in services and then the protection of intellectual property rights. And the WTO is a consensus driven uh, uh, body um, and the main principles they concern non-discrimination that states must not discriminate uh, between the trading partners. Um, it concerns market access, uh, reducing uh, tariffs and eliminated uh, trade barriers. It's about transparency. So 
businesses and states as well, they can anticipate what are the particular requirements that it takes for a product to enter into uh, another state. And then finally, one about fair trade. Um, and that's actually an, an issue where there have been, um, I think it's actually three of the cases that Russia um, has made against the, the EU. It concerns uh, EU's application of anti-dumping uh, anti -dumping measures, um, which are imposed on uh, Russian products. And that falls into the fair trade um, area. Then I think if you take a look at the WTO website, you would probably also see that the right that environment is is one of of the uh, main aims of uh, the WTO. However, it's mentioned in the WTO agreement in the preamble, but it's not really something that has a strong solid basis in the treaties. There's not one particular treaty that concern this balance between trade and, uh, and environment. The WTO institutions, now if, if we are going to, to try to understand what this dispute settlement system, what it is, I think the first place we, we must start with is the context. And as I said before, it's a member driven institution. Uh, the WTO itself does not make any decisions but they do it through the bodies, the Ministerial Conference and the General Council, and they um, consist of all the WTO members. And then we have the dispute settlement uh, body. Now, as I said before, it is, it is not a court in a traditional sense, uh, or at least not the EUA, um, but as I've been claiming, it's a court de facto. The way it works is that if two states, they have an issue with each other concerning WTO law, um, one will file a complaint against the other. And the first step would be to see if they can find the solution themselves uh, uh, through negotiation. If that's not possible, a panel will be established. And that panel will deal with the facts of the case and the law of the case, and it will provide a recommendation. That recommendation can be appealed to the appellate body. And the appellate body will deal with law only, not with facts, uh, and the appellate body will also issue a recommendation. Now, those recommendations from panels and from, from the appellate body, they are not judgments, but they are recommendations on how the law should be interpreted in the specific case. The recommendations will, will go to the dispute settlement body and the dispute settlement body that is also all, it contains all the members of the WTO. The dispute settlement body technically can reject the recommendations from the panel and from the appellate body but they can only do that through full consensus. And that has never happened in WTO history that all the 164 uh, members of the WTO, that all of them have rejected the recommendation uh, provided by the panel or the appellate body. Uh, and of course, we are not, I would not expect ever to see it because it would also mean that the winning party of the case would have to reject, uh, reject that. But it is a big change from the former system uh, called GATT, um, because in the old GATT system, the one that existed before the WTO was established in 1995, the old GATT system, it was based on that a veto between the GATT contracting parties, a veto could be used to disregard a panel recommendation. So, but that veto doesn't exist uh, anymore. Now, and that brings me then to the question of providing legal certainty. What is the legal value in particular of the recommendations made by the appellate body? And again, uh, as I said before, we, we need to keep in mind that this is a, a system of states. We, we don't have 
uh, an institution here, a body that can create uh, a new law. And there's been this long uh, fight over the value, the legal value of appellate bodies uh, recommendations. Now, a few things that we uh, clearly can see at, uh, in WTO law is that the panels on appellate body, they cannot add to or diminish the rights and obligations under the treaties. But at the same time, we will also see that panels and the appellate body, they must provide security and predictability in law. If we go back to the ministerial conference and the general council, they are the only institutions in the WTO that can make what we call final interpretations of treaty law or WTO treaty law. And that means that the members themselves, they can make interpretations of the treaties that are binding in the future. Now that has been interpreted by the uh, by the appellate body to imply that panels and appellate body cannot make any uh, decisions that are binding in future cases. And that means that they are binding in the concrete actual case between the two disputing parties, and that's it. But then we come to the question about what about legal certainty? What about if we come in a situation where there are, um, where there's been one case and we have an interpretation from, from the appellate body saying one thing, and then a few years later we get a similar ca case concerning the same issue. Shouldn't the appellate body then provide legal certainty by um, applying its, uh, uh, its interpretations from the previous case? And that has been settled in WTO case law in this, what I call the zeroing uh, saga. Uh, it's a they were three cases concerning anti-dumping, um, a spe special way that the US was calculating whether prices were dumped uh, or not. Now, in the first case that took place, the panel accepted the methodology by the US and the appellate body overruled it. Now, then came case number two concerning exactly the same issue and the panel referred to the previous panel. It did not refer to the to the appellate body and once again it accepted the US methodology and once again it was overruled by the appellate body. Then came case number three again concerning the exact same issue, same interpretation of uh, one specific provision of the anti-dumping agreement. And in case number three, the panel addressed the appellate body and the panel said that it was not bound by previous uh, decisions made by the appellate body. And the appellate body once again overruled the panel and then it stated that ensuring security and predictability in the district settlement system, that implies that absent cogent reasons an adjudicatory body will, resol will solve the same legal question in the same way in a subsequent case. And that means that although the appellate body and the panels, they are not courts, they, in particular the appellate body, have taken this pre precedent-like function. And by doing that, they are also giving legal certainty as to the interpretation of the WTO uh, treaties. Now, it does mean that the ministerial conference and the general council, they can at any time go in and make a final interpretation uh, if they disagree with the appellate body. And of course, the appellate body would have to follow uh, that interpretation. But until they do that, I would say that the appellate body is providing legal certainty uh, through its uh, interpretations. Then the next question concerns this fragmentation, um, legal certainty when we have overlapping issues between trade and uh, and environment. As I said before, there's not an environmental treaty in the WTO, and that means that it can be quite difficult really to find out how do we establish that balance between environment uh, and, and trade. There's been several cases concerning that. Uh, and 
one place uh, to look is that there are some exceptions in w WTO law concerning trading goods, where it is actually possible for a state to have environmental protection uh, and uh, impose environmental requirements on the goods that comes over the border. The problem has more been like those about extraterritorial jurisdiction, uh, where there have been cases where um, the US uh, rejected shrimp harvested in Malaysia uh, because they applied some harvesting methods that could damage turtles, and that was in order to protect uh, the turtles. But that was within Malaysian territory that that took, took place. But as the appellate body said in that case, since turtles can migrate, they can also migrate into US territory. And therefore, it can become a US issue and that can justify uh, that uh, ban on shrimps that uh, that the US made. Now, the US lost the case for other reasons, but nevertheless, the appellate body, without really addressing extraterritorial jurisdiction, it stated something about a nexus, a nexus that is between the particular animal and the state imposing the barrier. And they have said it also, even uh, without referring to that animals can migrate. Um, but there was the easy seal products case where an animal can be protected against specific hunting methods if they violate the public morals. And that was a case that Canada made against uh, the EU. So if there is a sufficient nexus that even though that a specific conduct takes place in the exporting state, it doesn't mean that the importing state cannot introduce uh, barriers uh, to trade. Now, so here panels and in particular the applet body, it has used the exceptions in GATT to say that environment can be protected. They have also, to do that, looked at international environmental law to in support of its argumentation. But it has also moved beyond that, uh, moved beyond what's written in the treaties. And um, they've been doing in some subsidy cases um, where they're without a clear legal basis in the subsidy uh, treaty said that it is actually possible to protect uh, climate efficient uh, products, even though it's not written uh, in the treaties. What it did in, in, that, uh, in these specific cases is that they said that there is a market for climate friendly products or products that are produced in a manner that's climate friendly, that is different from a production of products that are not uh, climate friendly. And in that way, they made an externality uh, argument in the cases and used actually market language in order to justify that Canada could support those businesses that uh, produced energy based on uh, climate uh, friendly methods. Now, final thing I will say here, uh, time is, is running, um, is that for the Russia EU trade relationship, they have moved that into the WTO and that means that there is the, the dispute settlement system that is providing legal certainty for businesses and for their investment strategies. Now, of course, we cannot just completely ignore the political side of, uh, of things. Um, first of all, the dispute settlement body that's for states only, businesses have no standing there. So that means that if they have an issue, they must go to a national court and make a claim based on WTO law. And then it's up to the national court to decide whether they will apply WTO law or not. Then, of course, it's also used as a strategic battleground. Um, um, for example, you might experience that if one uh, state wants to make a case against the EU, um, the EU Commission might consider if they can counteract in some way by making a claim against that particular state. And that could also be, for example, against uh, Russia. They 
you can always find something to make a case on. Um, so, but it is that is really a political a decision that's made there. And then the current issue we have, I can talk about the applet body that is developing a rule of law, but the applet body of the WTO is not functioning at the moment because there's only uh, one member left. There must be three members in order to handle a case. There's only one left, and that is because the US, uh, it blocks for all uh, new nominations for um, for people uh, or lawyers who should be in the appellate body. And that is because the members of the appellate body, they sit there for, for a term of four years that can be renewed one time only. So the appellate body is not working at the moment, which of course is a, a big, big problem. Right. Thank you very much. My time has definitely run out, probably also a while ago. Apologies uh, for, for that. Um, but thank you so much for listening. Thanks. Thank you, Henrik, for this overview of the uh, WTO dispute settlement system, which is not easy to grasp uh, because it's not something that uh, we are so familiar with. And of course, as you concluded, there is a political dimension to it, which is uh, fascinating. Uh, but clearly, it's a, it's a good way forward to uh, promote uh, the rule of law legal certainty uh, in, in trade matters. So I think, again, it's a good example of a, of a tool to uh, to actually fight uh, what you just described as the strategic battleground uh, of, of trade and, and beyond energy, obviously, as well. It is time for our Q&A uh, session. And um, for this Q&A session, I have to inform you that uh, we have received some requests, prior requests, from individuals representing uh, groups of um, uh, individuals or organizations based in Cyprus or in Russia to address this symposium uh, at the Q&A session. So we, we thank them for their interest. I am wondering whether Ms. Natasha Kardash is with us. I didn't see her in the yeah. in the chat. Yes, yes, I'm here. I'm here? Yeah. Okay. Yes, so yes, thank you. Let me introduce well, like you first. I would like to welcome first. everyone and thank for the interesting conversation we had so far. Hello, so thank you, Hello. Natasha, for being here. You're the editor-in-chief of the Russian newspaper in Cyprus, Vesnik Kipra. I think most of us know it but also the magazine Successful Business magazine. You're the vice president of the Association of Russian Speaking Residents of Cyprus and board member of the Coordination Council of the Russian Compatriots in Cyprus. And uh, we have decided together and discussed that it would be very helpful tonight if you could share with us some words about the Russian community of Cyprus, who they are, what they do, and uh, how we could enhance further relations. Thank you, Natasha. We're listening to you. Mm. Thank you very much for this introduction. And before coming to the community, I would like to thank uh, previous speakers for the theoretical uh, knowledge and uh, especially uh, Ms. Uh, Kazaku Markulis for her introduction uh, on the historical uh, framework of the Cyprus-Russian relationship. I will be very practical. Uh, during two, three minutes, uh, I will just share with you some facts on the Russian-speaking community of Cyprus. Uh, there are about uh, 50,000 people who live in Cyprus permanently and they speak Russian at home. We call them not Russians, but Russian speakers, because these people, they came from different countries and they might be of different nationalities. What unites them is a Russian language that they know very well. Uh, I need to say that these days, this Monday actually, um, we started a serious and professional social demographic research on the Russian speaking community here. Although Russian people live in Cyprus since the 70s, uh, there were no attempt to understand with proper instruments uh, of uh, social researches who they are, 
what they do, um, where they live, where their children go, what languages they know, and so on. So together with uh, a professional um, agency here in Cyprus, we launched the research, and by the end of January, we will know for the first time who are these uh, 50,000 people and what they do here. Uh, on my opinion, being a 20 years uh, publisher of a Russian newspaper and editor-in-chief and reading all news about Cyprus-Russian relationship and Russian community here, majority of my compatriots who live in Cyprus, they belong to two um, uh, two fields. Some of them, they are family members of uh, Cypriot families, and some of them, they are an international business. I need to mention an important fact that the, um, the start of uh, this uh, inflow of Russian businessmen to Cyprus was due to one unique agreement that was signed between Soviet Union and the Republic of Cyprus in the 80s. It was a double tax treaty avoidance agreement. Uh, so uh, Soviet Union didn't have many agreements of this kind, especially with so-called capitalistic countries. Uh, and Cyprus was one of very few countries that not only had this agreement in place when Soviet Union has collapsed, and in you, uh, business people in Russia, you know, we, we didn't know much about private business and especially about international business. In the Soviet Union, all international activities were handled by the state. So when Russian businessmen wanted to open an international company or they wanted to establish a foreign trade, an international trade, they needed experience. And here, Cyprus was a very important partner because in Cyprus we had so at that time, and now even more, we had so many Russian speaking professionals. And again, here we speak about this soft diplomacy of the Soviet Union, one of the best inventions, I would say. Soviet Union has offered to Cyprus a lot of free scholarships and a lot of Cypriot professionals during many years went to the Soviet Union for free studies. They were coming back sometimes with Russian wives, but with education and with the knowledge of language. So they were the main people who met the newly born Russian private business when this business wanted to go abroad. Closing uh, about this small overview of the Russian community here, I need to say that uh, now there is a second generation of Russian speaking people uh, of those people who came in Cyprus uh, 25, 20 years ago, a new generation of children who were born in Cyprus, who went to schools, and if you ask them who they are, they would say Russian Cypriots. So we have uh, quite a few thousands of um, kids, my daughter is one of them, she's 24, uh, who were born here, and they have in them both cultures, they love both countries, and Russia and Cyprus, and they believe that they are Russian secrets and they are ready to contribute a lot for strengthening uh, of the relationship between our two countries. That's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, this is very interesting. We, we look forward to having more demographic and socioeconomic information on the Russian speaking community of uh, of Cyprus, which is probably the largest uh, community on Cy in Cyprus, the largest um, binational community in Cyprus, because of course uh, we have uh, all the European states as well, you know. So it's it's very interesting how the the, the Cypriot um, uh, demography is changing uh, due to the second generation that you are discussing now. So I'm sure there'll be questions for you later, Natasha. So. Thank you for your intervention you. and stay with us. Now, I will call also on someone else to make an intervention and then we can open the floor. Uh, her name is Diana Borisova. She's a young person, a young woman. She's the co-chair of the Youth Club of Russian Compatriots. She's an alumna of MGIMO University and she's an international journalist and PR specialist. And uh, we, decide, we discussed together that it would be a good idea to present a project which they are launching, uh, launching which is called Future Room in Public Diplomacy, Making Connections Stronger. Diana, are you here? 
Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much for having me tonight. I will try to share my screen now. Uh, yes, and I will try to make it very fast because I know that I have got only five minutes and we are in this uh, section now, so I need to be fast. Yes, uh, so let me start. Uh, this is our plan and let's start off history of our Youth Club of Russian Compatriots just to understand who we are because without it we can't understand what we are doing. Uh, officially, we began to work as a first Youth Club of Russian Compatriots in Cyprus in 2019. And our main goal um, was to carry out joint events and projects which are interesting for local audience and for our compatriots. Uh, we are very active in the spheres of ecology, volunteering, education, public and cultural diplomacy. That's not a secret that here in Cyprus we have got a lot of NGOs, youth NGOs. Um, but um, they are trying to work with uh, probably with only local audience or sometimes with European uh, society. Um, as the Russian compatriots, firstly we start to work with uh, our compatriots, but we opened, uh, we start to work with everybody here because how to help our people to integrate to society, only to be in good connections uh, through the common projects with the local NGOs. So, with the support of Russian Cultural Center in uh, Cyprus, also known as a representative of Federal Agency Rosatrunchstvo in the Republic of Cyprus, and our colleagues, partners of uh, Cypriot international organizations, we are doing a lot of uh, events. Now, for sure, it's online. When we could do this, like make gathering, we start to mix offline and online events, but now it's only online. And uh, yes, every Friday now we have got our own radio show on local radio station lemoniradio.com uh, with support of Creative Universe Foundation and Russian Culture Center. And the main goal of uh, this radio show is to speak about local but funny news, not touching politics, COVID-19, etc. And to introduce local society Russian culture through um, musical industry. Uh, yes, our big project is Futurum. Uh, we started to make it in uh, early April 2020. It started um, as a first seminar about situation um, in countries, European countries, about um, coronavirus. We gathered our friends from uh, countries and we start to speak how it is uh, situation uh, in uh, their countries. And after all, we understood that uh, now our life will be changed for sure and we need to shape our future, not just following the flow. And uh, the main goal of the project is uh, that we are creating uh, folks of negative and positive scenario together with an, with an expert. Uh, so it's not just like discussion that in 10 years we will have got this or that. It's like we can uh, choose our road altogether and youth can really shape the future. We touched uh, such themes as psychology, ecology, economy, um, beauty um, sphere. I mean, all the spheres which are somehow connected with youth. For sure, social media marketing was uh, a very topical theme for youth. Yes, there is uh, our goal. So uh, we are working like experts plus youth. We have got negative way, positive way of scenario, and we are creating future in this way together. Uh, our participants who took part in our event that now we have got uh, about 100 specialist speakers who have taken part in our project. Also, we are very proud that uh, in uh, this project in Futurum have already taken part Deputy Minister to the President um, Kiriakos Kokinos for Research Innovation Digital Policy because um, he was an amazing speaker speaker about uh, innovation in Cyprus and Europe and in Russia. Uh, also Cypriot audit company uh, CPV because uh, we know that in August we have got um, a little bit maybe not crisis um, but let's say uh, some economical issues if we're talking about our relationships between Cyprus and Russia. And also we are very good friends with European Cyprus Society, it's youth NGO actually was celebrating together 60 years from establishment of international relationships. And we made an amazing brochure, which we, um, uh, in this brochure, we touched some themes about 
youth public diplomacy, which was amazing. For sure, we have got our informational sponsors. And first of all, it's Federal Agency Rosso Trunchistva, TV company Ruski Mir, also portal of the Moscow House of Russian Compatriots and Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russian Federation. Uh, also, the official mass media of Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russian Federation Interfairs and embassies of Russian Federation in a few countries. Uh, our geography is like, I guess it's bigger than 20 countries. You can uh, see them now. Also, every time we have got our honor speakers, uh, actually it's uh, Mr. Denis Vladimirovich, uh, every time, uh, and from uh, side of uh, United Kingdom, like Embassy of Russian Federation in United Kingdom, because partner of Futurum project is also Kalinka NGO, which is located in Russia, and uh, Youth Club of uh, Compatriots in um, United Kingdom. That's our contact. I was trying to make it very fast, so thank you very much for having me tonight. It was an amazing experience for me, and I'm proud that as alumna of Gimo now I can speak uh, in this high level of symposiums. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diana. Uh, your presentation is in the Microsoft Teams folders for this event, so uh, all participants can actually take it away with them. Uh, if they want to, they can download it from the folder. Uh, the presentation by uh, Igor and uh, the presentation, the slides by Henrik are also there. Uh, there is also a pamphlet, which uh, I have here, I will show it to you. It's a, a nice pamphlet that was actually issued, uh, published by the PIO. It's on the 60 years of the uh, uh, Cyprus-Russian uh, relations. It has very nice pictures in it and uh, Dennis was kind enough to provide the electronic version, which I didn't have. I only had this, which I had grabbed from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So uh, thank you for this, Dennis. Um, and uh, there is a bit of material as well from Yukon Cyprus, but uh, you know, feel free to download anything you want and get in touch with people who have all given their email addresses uh, if you would like. Uh, Natasha, you're welcome to, you know, also send us anything you would like us to place in that Microsoft Team folders if you would like to. So now the floor is open for uh, everyone to ask questions to our participants, speakers, delegates. If you could please keep your comments or questions brief and use the chat as much as possible. I am monitoring the chat. And if someone really feels that they want to uh, engage by turning on the camera and uh, their micro, we are, we are happy to do this as well. I hope Igor and Henrik are still with us. I can see Igor and Henrik, yes. So the floor is open if anyone would like to ask a question. Okay, why people are thinking there was one question in the chat already. So let me go back to it. It's not an easy question. Uh, it was a question asked by um, a, a student and uh, the student was asking in what ways can our military diplomatic relations, I suppose between Russia and Cyprus, uh, strengthen Russia's involvement as a counterweight to Turkey's actions in the context of the Cyprus problem. That was before Erato's speech, however. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if there is something more to add to what Erato has already very ably uh, discussed. Erato, do you think there is something you would like to add? Uh... For us, uh, for Cyprus, um, the diplomatic support and the political support uh, that we have had uh, all along uh, from uh, the former Soviet Union and from now from uh, the Russian Federation has uh, been uh, extremely valuable. And um, uh, first of all, um, uh, all the governments uh, of the Republic of Cyprus uh, and all the political uh, forces on the island uh, know that uh, our struggle will never be a military struggle against uh, Turkey. It will be a political struggle. So uh, for us, uh, what is uh, important uh, and what will continue to be important 
is uh, to maintain this uh, uh, very strong bond of friendship uh, uh, between the two countries and the political shift, as I mentioned, uh, because I think that uh, uh, Russia has uh, um, served throughout these years, especially in the Security Council, as a political shield, yeah. uh, uh, countering uh, not only Turkish, uh, but uh, also Western, um, uh, as the rector said, uh, don't forget uh, that the green light for the, the for the uh, Turkish invasion was given by the then uh, um, uh, Secretary of State uh, of the United States, Henry Kissinger. Uh, so um, we have uh, had all along uh, um, attempts uh, both from Turkey, but also from its um, allies, especially uh, the United States, uh, different administrations of the United States uh, and the United Kingdom uh, to um, uh, inject uh, harm uh, to the Republic of Cyprus and uh, uh, the Russian Federation, uh, the Soviet Union before uh, acted uh, as a political uh, shield uh, protecting the Republic of Cyprus. Uh, one of the most important um, resolutions that were adopted uh, and continues to be uh, in force uh, is a resolution which was adopted uh, in March of 1964 with the help of the Soviet Union, and that was resolution 186 uh, of, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was March uh, uh, 1964, uh, by which the uh, peacekeeping force uh, was mm -hmm. established. And uh, uh, part of this resolution was also the recognition that uh, the Republic of Cyprus and the government of the Republic of Cyprus continue to exist. Uh, and I mentioned this because there were attempts at that time by Turkey, uh, by the UK and by the Americans uh, uh, to um, present uh, the Republic of Cyprus as a curtailed uh, sort of uh, state uh, that did not represent um, the, um, uh, the Turkish Cypriot uh, community. Uh, but this resolution reaffirmed uh, the uh, continuation of the Republic of Cyprus, despite the withdrawal of the Turkish uh, Cypriot community from uh, uh, all the government institutions. Uh, so it's one of the most important resolutions uh, ever adopted especially for the continuation of the Republic of Cyprus. And when I mentioned uh, the speech by the then permanent representative, which uh, took about two hours, if you look through the verbatim records, uh, and I have one of the best uh, collections of these uh, UN records, uh, you will see that he was speaking for about two hours in the mm -hmm. Security Council, um, supporting this uh, particular position that the Republic of Cyprus continues, uh, despite uh, the, the threats uh, of um, invasion at the time, but also despite um, the uh, attempts at uh, dismemberment uh, of the Republic of Cyprus. So uh, to answer the question for us, uh, I think it has been all along uh, uh, most important to have this political support uh, from, uh, from Russia than any military cooperation uh, uh, to that effect. Thank you, Arato. I don't know, I don't know I don't if uh, Dennis uh, has a different uh, <laughs> approach, but I think we, uh, we coincide. You, you, so, would you uh, like to I absolutely you? agree, absolutely agree with Ms. Kozak Makulis. And uh, I just wanted to add that we, as a permanent member of the Security Council, I mean, the Russian Federation, we are interested in uh, creating the atmosphere of stability and security in the uh, Mediterranean region. So for, to, to achieve that goal, we are ready to work with, with, with Turkey as well. So, but uh, you know about our principal stance on the Cyprus issue. We always support the Republic of Cyprus and we'll continue to do that. Thank you, Dennis. Um... There is. There are two other questions in the chat, and they are not easy questions. Uh, one of them uh, touches upon Ukraine. 
Um, it's from Achilleas, and uh, it says, uh, will the recent majority decision of the Holy Synod of the Cyprus Orthodox Church to recognize the independence of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church harm the Cyprus-Russia relations? To be honest, I'm not aware of whether this is factually correct, so I'm relying on what Achilleas says. I don't know if uh, Dennis would like to say something. Well, I, I think I'm not in, in a right position to, to comment on the religious issues. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, because, you know, the church is independent from, from the state. And uh, actually, recently there was a statement by the ambassador, of Mr. Asachi, uh, and uh, it was published, I think, uh, in the newspaper, so just a couple of, a few days ago. So you, okay. you can see it, yeah. So we could we could refer to this. Yeah. Actually, what you said is very interesting. Um, you know, uh, so the Russian Federation is is a state where um, religious matter uh, matters are separated from state matters, and this is very true of uh, where I come from as well, from France. Uh, the Sicilia state is uh, what we have that is more most fundamental. But here in Cyprus, um, the two are quite mixed. Uh, religious and religious affairs and politics sometimes uh, mix uh, uh, each other. And so it's interesting to see that um, uh, despite the, re the religious shared tradition between Cyprus, there is a different, different approach to the role of religion. Uh, in the state. So I don't know if Erato or anyone else would like to say something about it, because what I said may be a bit provocative, I'm not sure. No, I would not like to uh, to engage in that. Uh, of course, it's a historical uh, role yes. uh, for Cyprus. If you look uh, uh, throughout the, uh, especially the period of the Ottoman uh, rule, uh, the Church of Cyprus uh, uh, was not only uh, the um, uh, head of the uh, Orthodox uh, Church. The Archbishop was not only the leader of the, uh, of the Orthodox uh, Church, but he was the ethnarch, which means uh, uh, he was the head of the uh, ethnic uh, uh, community of, uh, of Cyprus with uh, all that uh, this entails. And this is why uh, the uh, Archbishop uh, and the Church uh, had been very much involved uh, uh, in the um, uh, anti-colonial uh, struggle, uh, but also the uh, then uh, struggle for enosis, uh, uh, which was um, connected with the anti-colonial struggle. Uh, so it's a very there is a historical explanation for this uh, yeah. for this role. Uh, of course, uh, in the um, uh, constitution of the Republic of Cyprus after 19. 60, there is a complete uh, separation between mm -hmm. uh, church uh, and uh, uh, and state, uh, but the role of the Archbishop is always uh, there. Um, I think it's very unique uh, in, in mm -hmm. the whole world uh, for uh, for a church uh, for church leaders uh, to uh, uh, engage um, uh, so much in politics. Thank you, Erato. Um, there is another question in the chat, but again, it has to do with uh, with uh, religious affairs. So I think we will we will skip this. Uh, mm. Do we have any other uh, questions from anyone? If Natasha would like to say something, Igor or Henrik would like to add something. Um, Yes, I, I would like to uh, interfere a little bit. Uh, I know that uh, our um, time is soon to finish, but uh, I would like to congratulate you with uh, uh, this idea to make this event and to discuss Cyprus-Russian relationship. This year is supposed to be a year of celebrations, 60 years, and uh, the whole Republic of Cyprus was ready to celebrate its anniversary, but also it's a year of anniversaries uh, with the relationship between countries. And as Mrs. Serato said, the uh, Soviet Union has recognized the newly born Republic just two days uh, after, and uh, 
President Makarios actually sent the letter announcing that the Republic is created a few minutes after midnight to the Soviet mm -hmm. Union. That was very good. So I wanted to say that we need to continue this dialogue. And I'm sure that there are so many dimensions and so many questions uh, that might be discussed. Uh, among them, historical uh, roots, uh, historical cooperation between our two countries. Uh, we can show how we are connected. Uh, they always say that we are connected by mentality. What does it mean? Mm -hmm. uh, they always say that Cyprus is dependent, they use this word, on Russian business. But why don't we look how, why, how it happened? And is it true? Because in my opinion, Russia is also dependent on the business relationship with Cyprus. And Cyprus-Russian business relationship is a good example of mutually beneficial cooperation in this field. And now we know the new dimension, IT dimension. Cyprus has good chances to become a kind of Silicon Valley for the Russian speaking IT community. And when we speak about Russian speakers, we say about three countries. Uh, it's uh, Russia, Ukraine and Belarus that plays important role in this field of IT business. And now our life is impossible without IT technology. So we are uh, having a symposium, not live. And it's the same time live because we are online. So the new technologies play a very important role and Cyprus can find its place here with the help of uh, very um, well uh, educated Russian speaking specialists because in Belarus, for example, is one of the strongest schools in the world when it comes to physio, uh, physics and mathematics. Mm -hmm. And so the last what I want to say that when they speak about Russian speaking community and uh, relationship between Russia and Cyprus, they should not forget about Russian compatriots. Only in Europe, there are 10 million people who speak Russian, but they are already citizens of the European Union. Uh, and they can be also a link between Cyprus and Russia. And even we do not need to forget even about our nearest neighbor, Israel. Among the population of Israel, there is one million people who consider their Russian language as a native language because they are Russian compatriots. And they can be good links, not only between Cyprus and Israel, but between Cyprus, Israel and Russia. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, I, would, I would uh, fully agree with Natasha because I think the bonds uh, between the people uh, has been uh, a very, very valuable component uh, of this uh, relationship. And if it was not for this affinity between the people, it's there, it has always been there. Uh, and uh, I mean, we can speak volumes uh, of the reasons why there is this affinity. It's not only the common religion, it's the culture, it's uh, um, the the history. Uh, and I, I fully agree with uh, Natasha that we should uh, uh, encourage uh, researchers, especially young researchers uh, from uh, the Russian speaking community or from Russian universities and from Cypriot universities um, with scholarships probably uh, to engage in research and uh, deepen our knowledge in this very, very important relationship uh, between uh, the two countries, but also between the two peoples. Thank you, Erato. And this is a very good transition to a question that is in the chat from Nadia. Nadia is a PhD student and colleague at the school, and uh, it's for Igor. And then there is a comment for, for Henrik. Uh, Henrik, if you want to check uh, Nadia's comment. Um, Igor, Nadia is asking whether, uh, you know, we could deepen uh, the relationship and the, and the research uh, between spatial, spatial geography and international law. And of course, uh, you know, uh, between in, in legal scholars and uh, geographists and international relations experts, because there seems to be, uh, I would say even be, with anthropologists, there seems to be, you know, quite uh, an overlap between our analysis of the situation in political sciences and in law, but also in geography and history. So um, spatial geography is a good way to uh, bring an innovative uh, approach to the study of international relations, 
law and history. What do you think, Igor? Uh, well, yes, absolutely. At least there is one sphere where geography, international relations, and international law works together a lot. This is uh, border studies, uh, maritime borders, which is a huge issue now, uh, and state borders, demarcation, delimitation of the borders. Uh, this is done with mapping, with uh, geography analysis, so, uh, well, at least this is a huge sphere and this is very comprehensive now sphere uh, because, well, we have borders now, not only, uh, well, the main borders between countries are now not on, on, on by land. Those are American borders, borders of exclusive economic zones, borders of continental shelves, borders of air spaces, which is a huge issue now. Uh, borders uh, in the surface, so there are huge issues of borders of the states, and that's I think that's uh, well the, the the sphere where geography, international relations, and international law should work together and probably produce some maps in that. Thank you, Igor. <laughs> Definitely, there is a, there is a, a strong link. Uh, in EU law, we, we tend to look a lot at uh, territorial um, issues and border issues, of course, and uh, it's usually a mixture of geography, uh, law and international uh, politics. So, um, yes, I mean, the European Union is a good example of this. And of course, the Mediterranean uh, region of, uh, of uh, border studies, including Cyprus. Henrik, did you want to... Uh, uh, reply to Nadia. I mean, she she put a, a nice comment that you obviously yes, the WTO you. is not something that people think about immediately. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Nadia, uh, for for the comment. I, I think what probably most uh, people engaged in in business what they don't think about is really the the WTO, um, and usually the starting point that is. What does the national law say here? Um, what is the national contract law in, in Russia? What is the national contract law in, in Cyprus? And then take it from there. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, in Cyprus case, they also need, of course, to have the understanding of, uh, of EU law um, because EU law regulates so much of, of uh, trade and transactions uh, between uh, companies. But without the multilateral trading system, we, of course, I, I, I don't know what the world would look like, but without it, I mean, it came for, for a reason uh, after the, the Second World War, uh, uh, when it was called GATT, it came for a reason. And that is, of course, the idea is that if we open up for trade, the trade relationship between the countries, they might not go to war with each other. That was a sort of... The, the idea uh, with it, and also because if we look at the Second World War, there was several trade elements uh, that actually were part of, of starting the war. That states they imposed trade barriers, subsidized their, their products in order to, to export, and that meant that we had this world, particularly in Europe, where we just had certain countries that simply made trade very difficult. So opening up for trade uh, is important. But back to the businesses, it can be a very good idea to have this understanding of what's happening on international level. Because if businesses, if they don't have it, they might face the surprises. I can give you a very good example of it. A Danish company, a quite big uh, shoe uh, producer actually, it might be 15 years ago, they thought it was a good idea to move part of their production to China. So they did. And the idea was to produce the shoes cheaper. And the production of the shoes was probably also cheaper. But imagine the surprise that that shoe company had when they were going to import the shoes they produced in China into the EU and realized that these anti-dumping duties were imposed on, on the shoes. So all of a sudden, it was actually... Uh, 
not not so cheap really for them to to produce in um, in China. And of course, had that particular company looked a bit more into WTO law, they would have known that there is this possibility to impose those uh, anti-dumping uh, measures. So uh, it is it is important, and I would say in particular with anti-dumping, uh, I mentioned before, I think three of the four cases that Russia has initiated against the EU, they've concerned anti-dumping. Um, so it, it is it is uh, important uh, to have an understanding uh, of it because it's it's all related. If anti-dumping duties are imposed on, on the goods, it will affect the contracts between the um, the importing and the exporting uh, companies. Thank you, Henrik. If none of the speakers uh, and participants have anything to add, I'll proceed with the, the closing address and a few thoughts trying to build on whatever was said, but it's interesting to see that um, I had prepared this, of course, before we started the symposium, but I think that uh, we are all, um, you know, um, adopting the same approach. So the conclusions I had prepared are actually quite fitted to what we have heard from all the speakers. So if, if you don't mind, I will um, share a few thoughts with you. Uh, and uh, we will then close the event on time because it's late in Russia. Uh, it's one hour ahead of us, so it's 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 time to do that. So, what do I take away from the various interventions of of today? Well, first of all, that we need to have more such symposia. First of all, I think that's quite clear. We need to have more such webinars and more and, and more involvement, including with um, what Natasha and, and Diana were presenting. So in other words, the daily life of people, because the daily lives of people clearly is, is not only about, you know, uh, who we are, but it's about what we want. And it's about, you know, uh, strong tides and, and, and common roots. So obviously, if we know where we have come from, we also know where we want to go. So that's that's very important. Um, so whereas the Cyprus and Russia bilateral relations are at their high and full mutual respect and trust for each other, the EU Russia relations remain, to say the least, frosty. And they are occasionally marked by trade wars, as uh, Henrik um, uh, explained to us, but also by war of sanctions and a um, certain level of integration fatigue. So, it, whereas it is in the interest of all nations or groups of nations to maintain good neighboring relations, and I come back to this term of neighboring relations, uh, I think it's quite clear that um, such good neighboring relations can be uh, facilitated at the level of a particular state. So Cyprus could facilitate this in the EU-Russia relations, uh, whereas at the same time we have heard quite a few times already that, Cyprus, that Russia guarantees Cyprus's right to sovereignty and facilitates the relations in the EU-Turkey-Cyprus uh, triangular relations. So I think that the renewed context of the pandemic uh, is yet once more an opportunity for enhanced and coordinating neighboring relations. A few years ago, I did some work with Russian and Ukrainian colleagues uh, it's, it's here, I can put the title in the chat. This is a beautiful book, which is on uh, good neighboring relations, actually. And it looks at um, the um, relations within the European Union, but also outside of the European Union with chapters uh, and Ukraine, uh, Cyprus, Turkey. So this is a very nice um a, a volume which is a, a few years old, but I went back to it and, and I think that, you know, uh, we can still and we can feel even more strongly the need for good neighboring relations. So on a global scale, the efforts towards the political and economic and energy integration of the Eurasia bloc, led by world powers like Russia and China, is a way forward to strengthen the foundations for improved uh, neighboring relations. 
uh, including with the EU. And along the lines of regional principles of global integration, such as the ones that Henrik uh, um, uh, described and uh, the ones that Igor illustrated, uh, there are renewed multipolar models of integration of different shapes that are being developed, respecting global balances. And the shaping of world politics may well occur away from the EU, uh, if the EU doesn't react. Um, reinforcing the role of EU member states entertaining good bilateral neighboring relations outside of the EU, such as Cyprus with Russia. The EU itself, however, is bound to its own values. And uh, one of its values enshrined in the EU treaties is actually the principle of good neighborliness, which is enshrined in Article 8 of the EU treaty. And I will read it out for you because it's not a treaty that usually people are familiar with. It's overlooked, actually. Uh, paragraph one uh, pro provides that the Union shall develop a special relationship with neighboring countries, aiming to establish an area of prosperity and good neighborliness founded on the values of the Union and characterized by close and peaceful relations based on cooperation. And paragraph two explains how can this be achieved uh, through the conclusion of specific agreements uh, with the countries concerned. Agreements may contain reciprocal rights and obligations as well as the possibility of undertaking act activities jointly. Their implementation shall be subject to a periodic consultation. Of course, there is no, um, there is no uh, precondition to this. So in other words, if something else must come before the agreement is, is reached, uh, and, and a workable agreement, this is acceptable. So I'm thinking in particular of the, of the uh, long-standing agreement between EU and uh, Russia, which is actually not advancing very much because of the realities of world politics. So in such a case, let's start with things that do work such as the ones that we have just uh, mentioned here, the good relationship between the people, but also the way uh, the EU and Russia and other states may engage into uh, dispute resolution mechanisms, including for trade and energy issues. Russia is at the doorstep of the Union, and this cannot change. Um, failing a good political entente, uh, the model of economic integration resulting in improved con conciliated neighboring relations has been successful before and can be worked in different shapes and sizes to accommodate the partners. Shared values already exist between the EU, its member states and Russia while respecting internal affairs and strengthening capacity building are uh, the main objectives of, of those values. Um, a renewed framework of peace and stability in the region is therefore expected of international political actors, including uh, the European Union. And I think that um, uh, the European Union would probably benefit from listening to uh, what we have been saying tonight. So these are my thoughts, and of course they can be developed into, you know, uh, further papers. For example, Henrik has very kindly uh, shared with us a draft working paper of his uh, intervention tonight. Thank you very much, Henrik, for doing so. Uh, and I'm sure that you know we could we could build uh, some more uh, research and um, policy papers around this. It's eight o'clock exactly, so I would like to uh, thank everyone uh, for joining us, our speakers for their time and efforts in preparing for tonight. Thank you so much. And also for the, part for the participants to be patient with us and, uh, and embrace the technology in, in the format of this um, symposium, which is uh, not easy for everyone, especially when you, co when you combine several countries. It can be challenging. For those of you who are not home, I can see that Dennis is not home, for example, uh, and a few other people probably are not home. Uh, I would like to wish you a safe onward journey back home. And uh, I would like to hope that we will see you all soon again 
please do feed uh, to do fill in the feedback form which we have um, in the Microsoft Teams and buy from me. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you. All the best. Thank you so Thank you. much, everyone. Bye. -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.